Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Paolo Batlera. I'm the interim director of the Italian Cultural Institute in New York. And I'm your host for this webinar, which is a joint presentation of the Italian uh, Cultural Institute of New York and the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles. Let me first of all thank my colleague in Los Angeles, Valeria Rumori, for her collaboration. And also thank to Maria Teresa Cometto, who has been the initiator of the series of conversation on sustainability and innovation, which was supposed to take place at the Italian Cultural Institute. Um, and then uh, she also was the initiator of the, uh, this move to the digital medium. Uh, last but not least, I'm grateful to Maurizio Vecchione, uh, Executive VP for Global Good uh, Fund of Intellectual Ventures, for accepting our invitation. And uh, with this, um, leaving uh, the screen to Maria Teresa in New York and Maurizio in Los Angeles. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining this virtual conversation. Uh, many thanks to the Italian Cultural Institute in New York and in Los Angeles for organizing this event. And of course, thank you, Maurizio, for uh, joining us. Uh, this is such a special time. Uh, we are all very sad about what's going on in Italy, in America, all over the world. And uh, we are also confused, afraid, I think that Maurizio is the right person to help us understand better uh, the risks we are facing and uh, uh, also to give us uh, some hope about what uh, we are going to find uh, on the other side of the curve, that is the title of uh, this uh, conversation. Uh, and you will give us hope, right, Maurizio? Hope, yes. Uh, <laughs> false hope, not. Okay, great. Uh, we, will, uh, we, will, we want to be based on science and facts, uh, of course. But before getting into uh, our conversation about uh, uh, COVID-19, I think it's uh, useful to know more about the background of uh, Maurizio. And uh, uh, so I'm starting uh, uh, with asking Maurizio a few questions about uh, uh, his experience. Uh, Maurizio. When and why did you get interested in science? Uh, I know that you grew up in Udine, Italy, and you studied the physics at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. How formative were those years? Well, let me, let me say first of all, um, uh, uh, Maria um, Teresa, just a slight digression which is um, I was uh, really on the phone this morning with a number of colleagues uh, in Italy. And the sheer magnitude of what Italy went through uh, presents, presents a window in the future. So I apologize for hijacking your question for a second, but I wanted to sort of recognize the, the incredible and heroic work that the clinical staff and the, res the first responders in Italy have been doing. Because in many ways, they're teaching all of us throughout the world uh, what some of this other side of the curve looks like. And, and of course, that's acknowledging the fact that they're just beginning to walk the road of the other side of the curve. But when you look at what's going on in Italy, in many ways, you have a window on the future. And so, um, so it, 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 and truly the Italian, uh, healthcare community has been walking unknown ground in trying to establish uh, some of the procedures and, and sort of reopening criteria on which we can maybe base some hope. We also um, are evidencing some of the dangers. So I, I thought we should for a minute recognize this incredible job that is, that is occurring uh, in Italy on behalf of really the entire world. Um, so going back to, you know, it's been a long time since I thought about my early days in science and, and the formative years. I was very young when I came to this country. I had just finished the Liceo 
um, and begun doing research at university level. But um, um, so I, I think what what the Italian educational system taught me a little bit, which I treasure even today, is sort of a a questioning mindset toward the disciplines and to look at problems in an interdisciplinary manner, um, sort of integrating points of views. Uh, some of it was due to, to necessity. We didn't have the experimental and other capabilities that would allow the tunnel vision that uh, perhaps modern science has today. And so I've always been um, fascinated by the intersects, the opportunities that lie at the intersect of multiple disciplines. I think that's something that has become a lifelong um, uh, strategy that I really did learn in those early years. Yeah, you mentioned that you came to the United States uh, a long time ago. Actually, you came in 1980, so 40 years ago. That's, that's a very long yeah, time. Yeah, actually, it's even earlier than that. It's 1978 when I first oh, landed okay. in California with a little bit of back and forth. Yeah, so, so, yes, I'm dating myself, but actually... <laughs> I passed an anniversary a while ago where I've been longer here than I've been in Italy, yeah. which is somewhat bittersweet and sad, but. <laughs> but uh, so you uh, came to the U.S. to go on with your studies and you go to, you went to uh, the University of California uh, in Berkeley. So what about the change of uh, scene from uh, Udine Trieste to California? Well, you know, I, uh, as, as, a, as a true nerd, a true science nerd, uh, to me that felt like a transition into a land of opportunity, uh, especially in the 70s and early 80s, you know, there was the emergence of Silicon Valley and a lot of the technologies that today pervade life, uh, including those that are allowing us to have this webinar. And so, um, so to me, as a technologist and a scientist, it was really a journey into all sort of opportunities that I hadn't seen. It wasn't really necessarily economic or financial opportunity. It was really a way of thinking around innovation, um, essentially questioning uh, prescribed uh, methods and really focusing on what, um, uh, what, what is possible. And I, I would venture to say that, you know, that is probably the great strength of what's going on in the science and technology field um, around the world, but certainly continuing to go on in places like Silicon Valley. And I think uh, it is that mindset that perhaps is stimulating a lot of the hope that I will try to share with you today, stemming from the great tragedy we're living in. Yeah. Uh, well, besides uh, uh, being a scientist, uh, you've done a lot uh, um, uh, of things in uh, the entrepreneurial field. You've been an inventor, an entrepreneur, founder of several startups. Uh, can you mention an experience of yours uh, that taught you something particularly useful uh, for, for today's uh, challenges? Sure. Well, I, you know, I think uh, a lot of people see a challenge as a challenge. And, you know, I was reflecting the other day that I seem to have had an uncanny ability to get involved with studying something new at the depth of a crisis. So um, I launched one of my most successful startups uh, right after the dot-com uh, uh, disasters when sort of technology was definitely not a, at the top of investors' appetites. Um, I did it again in 2008, right after the financial crisis. Uh, this is a different crisis, but I do want to point out, and I think that's gonna be some of the things I'll try to suggest in a little bit, that out of a uh, crisis, you also have opportunities. And so whether it's financial or economic opportunity, which could point the way to how we reopen the country and, how, and what we do, uh, with that reopened country, or whether it's individual opportunities, you know, I, I think uh, one of the key lessons is to not let the difficulties dog you down and to start thinking creatively about how, where, where the opportunities lie within each crisis. Yeah. Uh, talking about today, you currently work at the Global Good Fund, which is uh, uh, also funded by Bill Gates. Uh, when did you join this fund and what, what is the goal of this fund? Sure. So um, 
Bill uh, had a vision around the role of technology for good. So if you think about technology as an engine, uh, and when I say technology, it's a bit broader than strictly speaking technology intended as internet and, and uh, uh, mobile telephony. Really, when you think about the world of, of, uh, that we all live in, uh, and you think of the role of technology in changing our world, uh, mostly it has been an economic transformation. It has created new markets, has created new products. It makes life different, better, interesting. Some people would argue not necessarily better. Um, and, and that's great. Uh, but if you think about the 4 billion people that live in low and middle income countries, many of them did not have the opportunity to have technology be built and developed for, for their life. Um, so whether it's modern medicine and looking at what medicine has focused on in terms of diseases, uh, or whether it's looking at uh, the impact of technology in economic life, the idea behind Global Good is to really focus it on humanitarian and um, uh, focus the technology development effort on humanitarian and for good applications, hence the name. And so we do science and technology, including primary work using our own laboratories um, uh, on behalf of humanity for humanitarian purpose or for good purposes, as opposed to uh, profit. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great. Maybe we we talk more about it later when we talk about vaccines or other stuff, uh, cures yep. and so on. Uh, so now from your biography, I read that you work also with other institutions, uh, pioneering new technologies and data science approaches to infective disease diagnostics, immunotherapies, as well as new approaches to healthcare with artificial intelligence and bioinformatics. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, knowing that, uh, let's talk now about uh, the other side of the curve. Many people continue to speak about flattening the curve, and we are in the curve today. By the way, this morning, uh, uh, Governor Cuomo, the governor of the New York State, uh, gave us uh, a lot of good uh, news, uh, saying that the curve uh, in New York uh, uh, is flattening and uh, maybe we have uh, we are past the worst uh, uh, moments uh, but first of all can you explain what the curve really means and your thoughts about uh, uh, how we should read the, the data sure well so um, it seems that these days everybody has a, a model to uh, to discuss and that's actually great. It's great that we're using data to try to understand um, uh, what we're doing. The reason why both I and Global Good and others that have been working in infective disease have been looking at models is because they have provided a, a data-driven view to the effectiveness of various intervention. And I'm, I'm using the past tense because that has been done in the course of many pandemics and many epidemics throughout uh, the recent history. You know, it's interesting, I was discussing this with uh, epidemiologists uh, just the other day. Um, this does, if it seems like these uh, diseases that we'd really never heard of before, are becoming more frequent. That's actually proven in the data. So something is going on, maybe in our connections between uh, and in close relationships with animal, maybe because the population is increasing. Something is going on that seems to be accelerating the number of um, epidemics. Just think of the last few years, uh, you know, we've had SARS, we had MERS, we had uh, swine flu. Uh, and many others that you don't know about because they were regional, uh, but were very much at issues in those regional uh, communities. So those of us that are operating in global health have been sort of chasing, how do you understand analytically what these, um, what these uh, infections do and how do they spread in the population? And that's the origin of a lot of the, the models. 
Of course, the, the epidemic that everybody's used to that comes every year is, is the flu. And, uh, and so a lot of models have been developed over the years surrounding how the flu spreads. But despite that, remember that models are just statistical constructs. They are approximations. They're just that, a model of what really happens because the number of variables when you really want to understand the mechanisms of, in which a disease uses to spread and then all of the influences on that spread such as social interactions, um, if it's a different type of viral uh, infection like HIV, then you have human behavior and lots of other factors. If it's malaria, you have vector uh, and uh, it, um, uh, you know, where are the mosquitoes and what are they doing, which also relates to climate. So these models have learned how to deal with some of these uh, issues that affect the spread um, in various statistical manner, which means they are, they're different. Each model has different sets of assumptions. Each model is optimized for certain applications. Um, I came to it because part of Global Good is an entity called the Institute of Disease Modeling, which has been building these kind of models primarily to look at infective disease in uh, low and middle income countries. So the models that were originally built uh, to deal with our polio eradication program, and then they were carried into malaria and other uh, diseases that traditionally the Gates ecosystem has been focused on. Um, and, um, and, you know, let me share with you, and actually I'll share the screen to do that. Let me share with you a few uh, slides that just show you what models can and cannot do. Um, so uh, right now I'm going to show you a very familiar curve, I think, because it's been used by many governors in the press, uh, even the White House. And this is a model created by the University of Washington, um, uh, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And actually this is data as of today, which shows you uh, mortality or the deaths per day across, in this case, all of the US. And so that, that it shows you- a, Excuse me, that is a, the red curve uh, uh, arriving to the middle. Correct. And, and when it's a solid curve, it, that's actual data. Okay. And the dotted line is essentially predicted. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a couple and of things have come me, out. And excuse me again, Maurizio, uh, if I interrupt you. Uh, that is about the whole uh, uh, America. Uh, we are Correct. talking about this is, the, this is the US. Um, if okay. you did go, uh, most of this data is public. So if you did go to the website, you could actually select individual states or, or even uh, other countries and look at uh, look at it individually. I chose to give you the sort of U.S. consolidation just to give you sort of a trend sense of what the models can do. Now, anybody in the audience who has some scientific training will probably recognize that curve as a bell curve or in more technical terms, a Gaussian curve. Now, that the fact that the disease behaves in a sort of bell curve model is an assumption. There's nothing that tells us that it absolutely will do that. Uh, now, if you plot the data on the left side, it sort of looks like an exponential growth that then levels off and, and peaks and then starts going around. So the first half of the curve seems plausible that that, um, that um, bell curve is indeed the behavior of, of this virus. The point I'm trying to make is there's no knowledge on the part of the computer or on the model about exactly what's causing the transmission and how the transmission is evolving. There's simply an assumption that if the first half of the curve looks this way, well, maybe the other half of the curve looks the same way in reverse. And we just need to kind of, um, uh, decide how high and how wide and how fast that sort of decay, for lack of better words, in caseload is. And to do that, most of these models look at real data and they kind of fit the curve uh, to that predictive model. Now, the shaded area gives you the uncertainty. 
So based on all of this, you can do a probabilistic analysis and decide, well, it could be as high as the top of that, and it could be as low as the bottom of that. And, and you can see the uncertainty gets smaller as the case, uh, the death, the mortality in this case, so the death load becomes smaller. Okay, that's, that, those are reasonable assumptions, but, but it is a model, meaning it's, it's guesswork. Uh, it's applying computer forecasting and probabilistic theory to a distribution, a statistical distribution, which is based on that notional bell curve that the disease um, will go through. When you hear a model is wrong, typically it means that some of those assumptions weren't quite right. Um, and for example, as we go to the question of what happens to the other side of the curve, um, well, that other side of the curve may be affected by many, many factors that may cause the disease to not behave like the first half of the curve. And we'll come back and talk about that. Yeah. But one of the, um, one of the um, uh, areas of uh, difficulty with a model comes from this other statistic. When you look at the uh, what's called the death rate, which is different than mortality, uh, but it's loosely speaking the percent of people that have died as a result of the infection. Um, you get this great disparity. Um, sadly, Italy is at the top of that statistic, and uh, you can see where the US is actually toward the bottom. Germany, also in Europe, is at the bottom, and this is for this particular grouping, you, there are other studies that have looked at other countries with lower incidence. Um, and, and you may ask, why? Why do we have the same disease with, um, with a, what appears to be a different death rate at different, in different parts? Um, are there some factors at work here? So people have speculated that perhaps is because Italy is is got a more advanced age as an average population, especially with the infected population. Other people have said that these type of data sets are affected by the amount of testing that is actually occurring. Yeah. And perhaps that. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, uh, Maurizio. Um, uh, one uh, uh, person in the audience uh, is uh, asking uh, if you don't have uh, uh, more recent data because this uh, goes back to March the 23rd. Yeah, so I will actually show you more recent data. Um, the, the interesting thing is, as the data continues to advance, the stack ranking appears to be similar. So the numbers are changing. Don't look at the absolute number in terms of death rate percentage, but, but the, the differences between the countries appear to uh, not materially change. Here's much more recent data. And what's interesting in this data is you're looking at the relationship between uh, tests per million people and uh, confirmed death per million people. So this is essentially filtering out. It's looking at the same thing that the other um, uh, graph was using, except it's now filtering out the, um, the, uh, the role of testing in the population. And again, or by the way, these are logarithmic scales. So as you move to the top or as you move to the right, um, you know, the, the difference is quite high. Again, at the very top here, again, we have Italy. Um, and that's despite the fact that the they rank quite high on testing. Um, yeah, well, and here's well, the US, well. here's the US, which is, which is still which is lower than Italy in testing, but it is already quite high. And if you look at sort of equivalent um, testing, but you go down here to South Korea, for example, um, uh, you know their confirmed deaths are much lower. So there is something going on here that uh, is not understood that is um, driving some of this heterogeneity in in the ultimate consequence of the virus, which is uh, uh, the death. And these kind of behaviors are really have not historically been captured in the models uh, that have been circulating. So I want to sort of end this digression. I'll come back to some of these charts 
a little bit later, uh, Maria uh, Teresa, yeah. but, uh, but I wanted to sort of uh, explain the limitations of models. Uh, you have to, you know, it, it's interesting because right now these are conversations that would normally only occur within public health and, and, and health authorities, but right now the whole country and frankly the whole world has, be, has been thrown into a gigantic science experiment. And so we're all asked to sort of think about risk and think about, think about these type of epidemiological factors um, um, in ways that we never had to respond to before as a, as a society. So it's important to understand all the sort of nuts and bolts mechanics that go behind these models. Yeah. Thank you, Maurizio. Can we put away for a moment this uh, uh, chart, which is... Uh... Okay, great. <laughs> we go back to uh, the sunshine. Yeah, um, right. Uh, mm, well, in fact, uh, I think uh, not for a person who is familiar with math and physics, uh, all these models uh, are very confusing because uh, I remember that at the beginning there was a model predicting uh, something between a hundred thousand and two hundred thousand deaths in in America, uh, and and now you just showed us a curve saying that maybe we are the peak of the curve, and and now maybe death the death toll will be much lower around a few thousand uh, a few ten thousand uh, uh, people uh, uh, casualties. So uh, it is really confusing. And on the other hand. Uh, I think that there is a lot of debat uh, debate uh, about uh, how many tests uh, must be done to have uh, reliable data and uh, how these tests must be done. Uh, it, everybody should have a test or can we have a kind of uh, a survey or uh, I mean a, 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 a champion uh, population that could be um, uh, uh, significant uh, for the whole uh, population of a, of, a peop of, a, of a state, of a, of a nation. Yeah, uh, you're asking some very fundamental questions. So uh, understand that the spread of the disease and the dynamic nature of the disease, even fundamental questions around immunity, you know, does the disease look like um, the cold, which means you can catch it again? Or um, does it look like the flu, which means the next year will be different and therefore it can spread all over? Or does it look like most coronaviruses, uh, say SARS and MERS, where it does seem like the immunity from surviving patients is more long lasting and therefore it's unlikely that you'll catch it again. Now, if you are looking at some of the press report and the medical literature, you'll see that there are various um, reports that people that were infected tested positive again uh, after recovery, as well as there have been various uh, reports that um, uh, specific antibodies are, are generated and therefore um, uh, provide immunity uh, over longer uh, periods of time. So it's all very confusing and the simple reality is we don't know some of these fundamental questions. So you had asked me to to talk a little bit about, we, we looked at one model that was a big approximation. And on this question, on the second half of the curve and the so-called flattening of the curve, um, well, we know that that flattening of the curve is happening and social distancing is responsible for that. Um, but the real question then that it begs is, what does it mean when we really don't have a grasp on the immunological, on the, on the long-term immunity uh, for the population, especially if you start relaxing those social distancing questions? Um, one of the examples that somebody suggested to me is that to think about the so-called flattening of the curve and the social distancing as stepping on a balloon. Uh, you don't, you can squash the balloon, um, but the total volume of the, of the balloon simply expands, flattened, it expands. You don't actually change it, not unless you pop the balloon. Okay. Popping the balloon in this example would be vaccination, having a vaccine, and vaccinating people on a mass scale. 
everything else that we're doing in terms of social distancing is that flattening, is that stepping on the balloon without popping it, which is a long-winded way of saying that we are probably going to slow it down, but we're not going to change the total, the total infection because the minute we step off that um, the balloon, it goes back to what it was. And so the real question here is, if you make the assumption the vaccines are coming, but they're probably coming at the population scale over the next 12 to 18 months, how do we manage the next 12 to 18 months without fairly rapidly getting back to the same place we were if we start opening things up? Mm -hmm. And it is not hopeless. You can actually uh, look at a delicate balance between public health interventions and techniques associated with that, technologies that can help do that better, as well as um, surveillance, which, which uh, means we do exactly what you are suggesting, uh, whether you sample the population and you quantify the relative immunity of the population or whether you're extremely quick at testing uh, against symptoms so that we have, uh, we can isolate the cases that do continue and we can then uh, prevent uh, this sort of out of control spread. There's no question the out of control spread that we experienced um, is because we were not testing, we did not have the ability to test sufficiently doesn't mean we have to test 100% of the people. We need to test certainly the symptomatic folks, and we need to test certain high-risk populations, including the medical providers. And the main purpose of that test is to make sure they don't continue spreading. And so that, again, you step on the balloon in a different way. You step on that balloon and flatten it by, um, by uh, isolating only the people who are infected as opposed to everyone, which is the situation we're in now. Uh -huh. uh, well, talking about uh, different approaches, what do you think about the Swedish uh, model that uh, everybody's talking about? I mean, um, <clears throat> we have total lockdown in Italy and things are not uh, uh, going well, especially in Lombardy and Milan. We have polls and social distancing in New York and uh, all over America. And um, while Sweden has uh, uh, adopted uh, a soft uh, uh, a low-scale uh, approach. Uh, and I'm quoting uh, uh, Anders Tegnell, the chief epidemiologist and top strategist in Sweden for uh, this problem. Uh, quote, locking people up at home won't work in the longer term. Sooner or later, people are going to go out anyway, and then you would risk a new huge infection wave. What do you think about that? Well, so there is a big difference between saying do nothing and let the virus just do its thing and do things, but do them in deliberate and selected way. Sweden and frankly, other Northern European countries started out with a do nothing approach. Um, the result is they have a much more severe incidence of the disease, although they are not necessarily, they have not necessarily experienced all of the consequences. Um, so they're going to be experiencing the, the impact in terms of lives lost um, in the not too distant future. You can see what's happening in the UK at the moment, well on track to become the next major um, uh, disaster area. Um, and you can directly attribute the steepness of the curve and the height of those peaks to uh, the timing and the degree of social isolation. I'm gonna show you a couple of other slides um, to sort of illustrate that point. Um, so I'm gonna move past, this is part of the work that uh, has been pioneering and frankly the first state in the US to experience a significant uh, set of outbreaks, including the first sort of known case was the state of Washington and particularly the city of Seattle. Um, what was interesting about that is that it occurred at a time when uh, a project was ongoing to monitor the um, 
the uh, annual influenza in the city. And so there was a particularly um, um, well-tuned surveillance system as well as testing system that ended up as, a, as the cases of coronaviruses ended up being recognized. And so it has spawned a whole set of epidemiological data sets that are very local to the city of Seattle and King County, but present a way to test the models on a on at least one sample. Excuse me, Maurizio. Can you tell us what are these curves? Yeah. So so what this is doing is it's looking at telephone usage, mobile phone usage, and it's estimating what where the population is aggregating um, uh, in comparisons to the middle lines for each category. The, uh, as a result of the various social distancing measures that have gone in effect over time. So you can see, for example, that the blue line at the top left, which is the commercial uh, population, people that were going to work in commercial setting, started dramatically declining uh, as the social distancing measures went into place. While, for example, residential populations, single family, multifamily, started climbing, and the oscillations that you see, the up and down, those are actually weekend versus weekday cycles. So what this is telling you is that you can use the data sets from uh, 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 the phones that are tracking their location and aggregate them to get a sense of where the people are. And actually, the little map is a sort of uh, a pictorial representation superimposed on the zoning areas of, uh, of Seattle, where you're seeing uh, the blue area would be the commercial districts, the downtown districts, and you can see the population there essentially moved out versus, versus the red zones, which are residential areas, and there the population is actually increased. And this is on, on a sort of uh, dynamic manner. Now, what's interesting about that is you can take this and um, you can also look, look at flow patterns. You know, how are people moving in and out of the city and around each other? And what you see, again, you see the, the peaks and valleys from the weekends versus the day, the day. but what you can, you can see is that essentially um, the social distancing measures are sort of flattening and shifting where people are aggregating and congregating. And so what, what is possible to do then is to take this kind of data and look at that famous other side of the curve from the perspective of what are the factors that affect transmission. Uh, some of you that know epidemiology, epidemiology uh, you probably have heard the, the term r naught. r naught is how many people does the average person infected with the disease will infect. And if in a, you want to be below one in order to prevent uh, uh, a spread. Um, you can see that when we started with the social distances, the r naught being measured in, uh, in this case, in the city of Seattle, was hovering around three. And which is one, generally- one, one person would uh, uh, infect other three people? Correct, that's what that means. You can then see that based on these mobility restrictions, which are represented by the orange curve, you can see how, how this uh, uh, r naught has actually been moving down, which means that we are infecting less and less people on average. And uh, as you look at the tail end of March, you're actually going below one, which means we stopped the infection. And this is really validating the fact that these social measures work. Now, you could then say, okay, what would happen if we started relaxing them? And you can start modeling various methods of relaxing, which is what public health around the country is starting to try to understand at the moment, whether they use models or not. But let's assume you have a scenario where you start relaxing these social measures and the r naught, and this is this yellow area, the r naught starts climbing again. If you have the intervention such as rapid testing and surveillance 
that allow you to squelch and isolate, then what you will go into is a mode that looks like this, which is essentially uh, an oscillation, where you're trying to oscillate to bring things back down below this sort of R naught of zero, or one, uh, and as you climb, you're relying on those uh, tr contact tracing and, and isolation for the people infected to come back down. This might very well be the picture that we live in until um, we finally have um, a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, which, which means that as a public health community, we must be able to um, have rapid testing. We must have testing widely available. We must have testing of different types. So we have to look at uh, viral load, who is infected. We also have to look at who is immune. Um, and so those are serology type of tests that people uh, may have heard. And then um, the other thing we need to be able to do is do this contact tracing, which is essentially rapidly identify who could have been exposed uh, to an infected person so that that group becomes subject to the social isolation, not everyone. Um, yeah. so, talking about that, uh, uh, well, let's go back uh, again. Can you take away the chart? Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, so uh, one uh, um, technology that can be used is uh, something that uh, Apple and uh, Google are, are working on this uh, app uh, that uh, would uh, uh, alarm uh, people if you are close to uh, uh, people, other people possibly infected or something like that. Well, what are we talking about? Well, you saw already in the data I showed you how we're starting to use uh, mobile phone geolocation to essentially look at where people are going and what what the correlation of that might be with the disease. Okay. Um, folks in China, if you if you've traveled to China lately, not very easy. But uh, folks in China have government mandated programs where essentially their phones have apps that um, that are um, that are color coded. And, um, and you're starting to have to use the color code in your app to gain admission to certain venues. So hypothetically, if you wanna to go to a restaurant and you have a risk of being infected or having been infected, I should say, um, the app that senses who you've been exposed to or who you've been close to will have a color code that may say, if you're red, you're not going out. And if you're green, you are safe because maybe you are recovering from having had the disease. Now that sounds very Orwellian and very draconian. And, and it does lead to the sort of, not only set aside the privacy concerns and all those other factors that perhaps in China are not as much of a concern, but it does sort of lead to this sort of two class society where you have, you have a group of people that are, um, that are, immune or cleared and you have a group of people that they're the pariahs and they have to self-isolate. If you go back to the day of the bubonic plague, it, it has some parallels to that. Now, what Google and Apple are doing is a friendly version of that. So what, what it's basically saying is it's looking at the geolocation and if there is a known case that is discovered later, let's say you and I are meeting and later I become diagnosed of the, uh, of the coronavirus disease, rather than manually for public health to have to call everyone that I've been come in contact, rather than having to figure out how to warn you that you were in contact with me and therefore you may have been exposed, which is what happens today, they're using technology to automate that. And so, you know, if I become infected, my phone would be able to tell every other phone number that I've been physically close to. And but, based but, on that, but, we could, yeah, we could the, warn the, those people. Yeah, but only if you uh, say so, only if you yes. allow. So, so that's why I said this is a friendly version because you opt into doing this. Uh, the, the logic is you wanna be protected. You wanna know if you've been in contact with somebody who's exposed and so, um, by enabling your phone to 
to track you, you're trading their privacy, but on the flip side, um, they, you will be um, alerted if, uh, God forbid, you've been exposed. So it becomes a voluntary participation, and it will work only if we have a critical mass of people doing it. But it is an example of the kind of methods that could be done technology-wise to go back to my oscillating curve to allow public health to quickly recognize who is the circle of infection around an individual that is infected and quickly squelch the resurgence of the disease. In theory, had we had all this in place, we could have done this on day one and not ever had the sort of exponentially growing curve that we've had. But uh, I think the hope is that we can get our act together to do it uh, during the sort of reopening phase so that we avoid having to do it all over again. Okay, uh, well, um, I'm going to ask you uh, uh, one or two more questions and I invite uh, all the audience uh, to send uh, questions to our chat room. Please uh, uh, send your questions and I will uh, forward them to, to Maurizio. Um, well, so I hope that you don't uh, uh, think like this group of uh, Howard uh, uh, disease researchers that, that uh, have just uh, written a uh, paper on uh, the journal Science uh, saying that people around the world might, might need to practice uh, some level of social distancing intermittently throughout 2022. Well, that's a long time. What do you think? Well, again, the question is what scenario are they planning for? If you ask me, they're waiting for a vaccine and they're looking at realistic, long-term classic vaccine development cycles, that's a possibility. Um, you know, I, I think Dr. Fauci uh, the other day on a similar question had what I thought was a brilliant answer, which was, uh, you know, is there a possibility that something is the case, that a scenario is the case? Absolutely, there's a possibility for just about any scenario. Is it a probable scenario? Um, I don't think so because of a few factors. One is, uh, and I'm gonna be specific to the US now, but uh, there are probably parallels in other parts of the world. Um, the, the testing capacity is uh, about to explode. I know that we've all been frustrated with public health and the promises around availability of testing, but the reality is the private sector has now been unleashed. Um, uh, last time I looked at the number of new tests uh, that were coming into pipeline, it was over 111 companies that were building different topology methodology of tests. Now the tests will have various quality and effectiveness. Um, so they're not all going to be used in the same way. But the point is that, you know, I do believe that as we look at the necessary ingredients to reopen society, having available testing, the kind of thing that would let go to a pharmacy and get tested, the kind of thing that would allow you perhaps even to take a test home um, and, and do it at home, is a necessary requirement, but I also think is going to be happening in the not too distant future. Yes. The, so, so that's the first one of my hopeful comment. And the second thing is the ability to do contact tracing on, a, on an effective way to essentially avoid the exponential growth will mean that we might be quarantining people who are infected until 2020, but we're not going to be necessarily quarantining society. Okay, um, Anna is asking to uh, go back uh, um, uh, and, and talk about uh, why Italy has such a disproportional number of deaths. Um, talking about uh, the number of deaths in Italy and, uh, and tests, uh, I wanted to uh, mention uh, the Italian virologist Ilaria Capua, uh, who wrote uh, a few days ago um, an article on Il Corriere della Sera, and uh, she said that all the estimates are intrinsically wrong, especially in Italy, where tests have not been done in a systematic way. So her opinion is that, uh, I mean, uh, any data well, about uh, the relationship between uh, 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 
people sick and people dying is uh, totally questionable. So I, I think Ilaria is very much correct. Um, uh, uh, she and I actually had a conversation about this not too long ago. So, um, so I, I, I think there are, you know, and I don't want to blame or even suggest that Italy did certain things wrong or poorly. Uh, quite the contrary. If you look at the healthcare system, especially in Lombardy, and you look at it by most healthcare outcome indicators, you could argue it's better than um, many U.S. states. Um, however, Italy was more or less the first Western country to really experience uh, the brunt of this. We can debate how and why, but, um, but, and so, as I mentioned at the beginning, Italy had to kind of invent the process without the benefit of a lot of guidance from other countries that have already experienced it. So they were late in epidemic timelines to implement the, uh, the social distancing. There was a lot of debate at the beginning whether social distancing was necessary, was needed, et cetera. So as much as Italy was one of the first to do it, when you compare it to the rest of the world, in terms of the transmission of the epidemics, they went a fairly long time uh, with an unchecked epidemics, which, which basically meant that the, um, uh, the peak was much more acute than uh, what we're experiencing. T take a comparison with the state of California, uh, who was one of the earliest states to implement social distancing and has had um, a relatively benign both mortality and, um, and um, uh, curve. Um, despite the fact that population wise, you know, it's the biggest state and it has um, in the US and it's not that far than the population of uh, Northern Italy in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the affected population. So, so that could be one factor, um, which, which doesn't totally explain it though, uh, because uh, as I showed you in that other chart, uh, when you start normalizing the data for uh, testing, um, you know, there still is a big difference. The other one could be age of the population. Uh, it could also be factors of density, right? That could also explain, for example, why New York City is being affected in different ways than say Los Angeles, similar population of cities, but completely different epidemiological um, uh, curve. So it could be that people living closely together uh, are just more conducive to the spread. Uh, there's been some debates about genetic evolution of the disease. While there are mutations that have been recognized, they're not the kind of mutations that would generally affect virulence. So that's unlikely to be the case. Um, the, one of the consequences that impact mortality, one of the consequences of having a much steeper curve, which also goes back to the question about uh, Sweden, okay, is that at, toward the peak, you overwhelm the healthcare system. And when you overwhelm the healthcare system, you don't have enough respirators, you don't have about th enough therapies, you don't have enough doctors to take care of patients, which clearly will have an adverse effect that, um, that, on the that, mortality. That, that, that happened in Italy, unfortunately, in Lombardy. Yes, and, and unfortunately, some of it was starting to happen in New York, but the social um, you, you know, some of those very models that I showed you before actually do point to what is the gap in things like ventilators. The states across the board in the U.S., but specifically in New York and California, have really reacted in ways that they've created a kind of strategic stockpile and search capacity. They had to do it under duress, but they, they did it. And so that's becoming less of an issue now yeah. in the city. And, and in other location. But the, the point is, all of these things are interrelated and they're probably at the root cause of, of the difference in mortality. Uh, but the fundamental real answer is we don't know. Mm. And it'll uh, be subject to study. Yeah, a question from Piera uh, from New York. Uh, um, Maurizio, what's your estimate for the reopening of New York City based on the status of the infection today? A million well, dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, I, I, this is the part where I want to point out that I don't speak for any official government institution or anything else. So, so this is, uh, we're having a fire chat where essentially you're getting the benefit of my opinion, which is worth absolutely what you paid for. Uh, so, uh, so it's guesswork. But if you want to look at this um, example of Seattle, which again is a little bit further ahead on the curve, than, uh, than the rest of the country, just out of timing. Uh, you know, you, you have these ingredients that have to be in place. Ideally, you want this R0 factor below one. Uh, so if you look at Seattle, it actually is there right now, but it's there with social distancing. Now it's barely there, which means it could come back really fast. So we have to be uh, extremely careful on how you reopen. So can you reopen, for example, factories and companies, but require social distancing and require the testing in case an outbreak occurs so you can rapidly uh, um, insulate it? If that's a definition of opening, then what you really need as a second and third ingredient is the ability to do the contact tracing and the ability to test widely. And I suspect that last point is going to be our limiting factor before we can start lifting some of these restrictions. So the question we really should ask is how long before tests are so widely available that no one has any issue getting them? Um, and getting them in, in a place where you don't have to have symptoms or you don't have to have special circumstances or risk factors um, so that you can continuously monitor yourself and ultimately work with public health to quarantine yourself if you need to. Um, my guess is that we're at least a month away from that scenario. Um, um, that's a generic statement. It doesn't specifically apply to New York. Um, New York and California are kind of leading the pack right now in terms of creating novel testing mechanisms. Los Angeles yesterday actually began doing random serology tests to the general population. Um, that's sort of a first. Uh, and that tells you they have enough tests available to do that. As I said, those 100 plus companies that are making new tests, some of them are the kind of tests you could buy and bring home. Um, those need the time to uh, ramp up production and get into a supply chain. So, you know, now, will we take some chances? Will we risk that we start moving up the curve again, uh, slightly ahead of when all these perfect things are occurring? I think it's going to be the decisions that our governors have to do and that public health supporting the governor have to do. You may have heard that there are, there's starting to be a coalition between states. Mm -hmm. uh, to sort of synchronize those kind of decisions on the West Coast, the three West Coast states, Oregon, Washington, and California, have all agreed to do this uh, conjuncturally. Uh, I think on the East Coast, New York and others are forming these corridors. Um, you know, at some level, um, the sound into sense, we, we should be looking at, um, at uh, this as a federal effort but it probably is a state effort simply because public health is primarily uh, handled at the state level. Yeah, uh, so talking about the federal administration, Lori from New York asks you, uh, how would you rate, grade the response of the federal administration at the onset of the pandemics? <laughs> You're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> well, let, let's just say that it was unfortunate that this subject has become a political subject and it shouldn't be politicized, okay? So what was done or wasn't done it will be the subject of a lot of studies. I do think that um, globally, we were late in recognizing the pandemic potential. And we were late in recognizing the pandemic potential because um, we've been unprepared for a pandemic despite the warning of all the experts. People like Ilaria, or my own boss, Bill Gates. Uh, I invite anybody who's curious to uh, Google the uh, TED talk that Bill gave in 2015, so five years ago, and it will give you goosebumps because he's sort of predicting all this. And he didn't know anything magic. He was just 
looking at the reality of what the data suggested, which was a, 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 an illness of this type um, uh, becoming pandemic was not a question of if it would happen. It's only a question was only a question of of when. And he predicted specifically that if you is modest investment in preparation would have would prevent trillions of dollars of economic loss, let, let set aside lives lost. And unfortunately, we didn't listen. So this is not the fault of one administration. It's not the fault of one government. It's not the fault of one country. This has really been a global issue. These areas were among the least well-funded and the least underfunded areas of, of health. Uh, because we tended to think of these infective diseases out of control as something that happens in, in places that uh, uh, are away from us. And, um, and the, the warnings of SARS and the warning of MERS and the warning of the flu swine didn't change that attitude. We're paying the price for it now. So I don't think it's a question of rating the administration. I think there's a lot of things that with the benefit of insight could have been done differently. But given the lack of preparation that we had as a country, as a society, and, and uh, even as a global community, um, you know, they're dealing with what they can. Uh, one of the things I would like to say, though, is I think our state governments really rose to the challenge. And, uh, and I think uh, when the, the history books have written about what has transpired, I think we're going to see uh, the role of the state and the public health within the state. Uh, despite the lack of funding and all that, uh, to have been uh, uh, very inspired. And I think, uh, I think uh, you know, there is a sort of A plus on that. I don't have an Italian analogy to, to explain, to, to rate sort of the Italian response at the moment, but we will see once all this is finished. Yeah, and talking about the global community, isn't it true that the, the, the same World Health Organization launched uh, uh, the alarm about the pandemics uh, very late. Yes, that's why I'm saying this is a collective, a collective uh, failure. Um, there's no question that delay has cost lives, and um, and it's not the the WHO's fault. Uh, it's a complex system of lack of preparation, lack of surveillance, lack of data. You know, with the the um, the the even the sort of genomic data that is at the roots of doing rapid vaccine development uh, if you if you look at the idea that we should know that coronaviruses are highly pandemic potential most of the amino acids that make up uh, the 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 um, the, the critical sort of uh, virulence mechanisms of coronavirus are, are very similar to each other we could create the kind of precursors to, uh, to a vaccine uh, based on what we know about coronaviruses in general and allow very rapid development. And these were all things that should have been planned and should have been part of the global community, but basically there was never a priority and never, um, and never the funding to do it. So maybe that, those are some of the enduring lessons that will come out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about this, the, you mentioned that uh, um, there are similarities uh, because there are different uh, coronaviruses uh, around, right? Um, uh, what about uh, the claim by a uh, biotech company in Israel uh, called the Miguel Research Institute? I don't know if you know it. They, they, they said that because they had developed already a vaccine uh, for coronavirus, uh, um, for the poultry, they will be able to uh, change it uh, very quickly and make a vaccine for this coronavirus. And they claimed it could be only a few months away. Is that uh, unreasonable? Well, their claim is not, is not unreasonable. Um, the science is not unreasonable uh, in the sense that uh, something that is shown to be effective in one coronavirus, including potentially animal coronaviruses, probably has many of the uh, 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 inhibitors that would work for, for this coronavirus. However, the timeline is what you have to be careful on. And I think this is true for probably a hundred 
vaccine candidates that are that exist today. There, it, it, you know, I have seen uh, that there are literally uh, hundreds of vaccine candidates making their way through the pipeline on an accelerated basis. So having discovered something that is likely to work um, and that might even work in vitro is great. Um, uh, that does not mean you're done. And, uh, and then translating that to a human model and doing the kind of clinical testing that is necessary, that's where the time is. And, and the important thing you have to understand about vaccines is that unlike a, a drug treatment, a vaccine is given to healthy people because it's a preventive. So you can't have a vaccine that, uh, that is essentially going to cause uh, adverse effects. Uh, you could argue if you're sick and maybe about to die, you will volunteer, gladly volunteer for a treatment that is experimental, although, although ethically that's not really done. But, but, but you definitely don't want to volunteer for something that is experimental if you're healthy. Uh, and to understand the, the potential adverse effects of a vaccine, you need to give it time because you have to see what happens to people during the trial to really understand what those adverse are. And that's what's causing the sort of 12 to 18 month timelines that you hear about is because we, we can't get there without following people for a certain amount of time and making sure that the vaccine is not creating toxicity or other effects on a mid to long term basis. And 12 to 18 months is short compared to normal vaccine testing time, which is even longer. Yeah. So, so my concern is you have to be careful a little bit. There's a lot of things in the news that basically say, we think we have it, but that doesn't mean it's ready to be given to the population, nor is it ready to be manufactured in volumes to the population. Seattle currently is testing two vaccine candidates that were rapidly developed, but what they're really testing is that they're testing that it doesn't have adverse consequences. Uh, once that phase is done, they'll be testing how effective it is. And when it comes time to sort of looking at the immunity, we don't understand enough in the disease to understand which antibodies are really the ones that give you the immunity or even how long that immunity will last. Uh, going back to the example of, uh, of the um, uh, cold, which is also coronavirus, or or going to the uh, to the flu, you know, you can see that when you take your annual flu vaccine, you have immunity for some amount of time, and then you sort of lose it. Uh, that will all depend. That's why these studies that are most important at the moment are the ones that are studying the antibodies that are really generated and that deliver, uh, and which one is really dominating the um, the immune response uh, in the case of coronavirus. And all that work is occurring, by the way, a huge amount of that is occurring in Italy because that's where the patients have been that have already sort of survived. And so there is some great work done by both Italian company and international companies that are working in Italy on that very subject, but it's all work in progress. Yeah, uh, one question uh, from Alessandro is about the fact that uh, there are three different strains of the virus which would require different vaccines. How do you know that this is occurring and what do you do? So let me say, I, I mentioned it earlier, there are genetic mutations that have been observed. There were a number of reports on this, but that's actually very common in any sort of... Uh, uh, virus. They are not um, the kind of mutations that cause a change in what I would describe uh, the virulence or other critical parameters that would affect the vaccine. So as of now, those strains mostly indicate the, the provenance of the virus. They let, they let you know what journey geographically through various populations the, the virus is done. That's how we determine, for example, that most of the caseload in, on the West Coast came from China, but actually a lot of the caseload in New York came from Europe. Okay, uh, it's by essentially tracing those those uh, very subtle uh, changes in the gen genetic makeup of the virus. They do not. There's absolutely no evidence that the. I I don't understand the. Uh, the coronavirus in Europe is different from the one in China? Slightly. Slightly. 
slightly. Essentially, as the virus goes through people, um, it mutates, and in part because it's interacting with other factors, including the host. And so you can literally do a tracing where given a case, if I took the virus of one patient, I could actually trace, trace back its origins through, through, a, um, uh, um, through genetic mechanisms uh, geographically. That, by the way, is used often in epidemiology to figure out uh, how an epidemic is spreading. Um, because, uh, you know, for example, in, in the case of polio, we're looking at that uh, genetics to determine in a disease that is almost extinct, uh, where do the cases come from? So you can apply the same thing here. And as I say, that's what these are when they're talking about these mutations and these strains, but they don't affect the mechanisms that uh, affect um, the virulence or other key parameters around the, the body's host response, which is ultimately what's driving the vaccine. So there is, at this point, no evidence that we will need special vaccines for special strains. That's not to say that it won't happen later, but for now there's no evidence. And if you look at other coronaviruses of pandemic or epidemic potential, such as SARS, um, despite some of these small mutations, the, they did not fundamentally mutate. So we don't have vaccines for any of those, but, um, but uh, they, uh, they did not become different, different uh, enough. Yeah, talking about the origin of uh, the coronavirus, um, yeah. Adele uh, asked this question. What about uh, the international responsibility for pandemics? Now the US is trying to accuse China for the coronavirus outbreak. Is there any ground for such accusations? Well, again, I, I tend to, uh, you know, I've been in global health for a long time and, uh, you know, you can always blame um, someone for something. But the reality is this, uh, uh, there's been awareness of coronavirus's potential for pandemic for a long time. Uh, there have been technical means to prepare uh, across the board with both the testing and the potential precursors to the vaccines. There's been research that has been conducted around the ideas of let's call them universal vaccines. And the reality is, despite the good effort of the scientific community, those areas have been highly neglected in terms of funding and at all levels, uh, whether it's the UN, whether it's state uh, and individual governments and countries, or by reflection, the private sector. So this is a question of really, um, we should be learning our lessons. When SARS occurred, a lot of a lot of us in the public health world spoke about the need to do all these things. And you can go back to articles and public speeches. You can go back to things like the TED Talk from Bill Gates uh, five years ago. The reality is nothing changed. So, so I think the real blame is our inaction. And perhaps our inaction is due to the fact that as humans, we're not very good at assessing risk. So think about it. We, we spend a lot of money preparing for certain risks because we perceive them to be high. Uh, we spend a lot of money putting fire sprinkler systems in every building. Um, we, you know, there is a relatively low chance that your building will burn down, but everybody has to do it because we decided as a society, we're gonna prevent that and made it into laws. Uh, we don't have nearly the same awareness around pandemic, at least we didn't. And, and so when we talked about pandemic, people's eyes would roll and say, you're being a pessimist and people die of the flu. And you saw the response even initially when this started happening, people called it a bad flu. Um, and so, so this is really, I, I think the blame is to us as a society collectively, and we need to learn how to assess risk much better and ultimately put our priorities where they belong. Yeah, however, there are many, many uh, reports uh, about the fact that if uh, the Chinese authorities had warned uh, uh, timely about this uh, uh, spreading disease, it could have been better, but... Um, no question, yeah. every day lost across the board, you know, you could make the same arguments for the US, you could make the same arguments for, um, for other countries. Um, 
so yes, I, I don't want in any way defend our response. I simply want to say that that uh, it's going to take much more than um, than a sort of policy change with one particular institution. It's really going to take some deliberate funding, deliberate institutional involvement, deliberate um, um, expansion of certain public health. If you want to be in the prevention business for, for a future pandemic. And mark my word, there was an article recently that talked about uh, 14 other pandemic potential coronaviruses found just in bats, okay? Um, so so the, what I said initially, that the number of um, um, uh, epidemics, not necessarily pandemics, but the number of epidemics seems to be increasing in frequency is suggesting that this is a, a risk that is increasing. And as a society, we need to realize that and we need to prepare for it. A very practical question from Maria. People who got the flu or pneumonia vaccines this season could have a slight protection against COVID-19? Well, again, I want to point out I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to provide uh, medical advice. Just looking at the literature, though. Uh, the scientific literature, there seems to be no evidence that uh, the flu um, uh, vaccine has any impact on the coronavirus. Um, so prob the answer is probably not, but again, you are, we're all in this giant science experiment, so we're all discovering the answers of these questions as we go. Um, one slightly different question from Francesca. Regarding the bounce back of med tech companies, do you have a view on where elective procedures will open up again? <laughs> um, well, you know, the, I, I'm using the model of, uh, of uh, medical centers that I'm familiar with, uh, which are not you know, which are mostly on the West Coast. So I happen to be on the board of UCLA and I'm also on the board of the University of Washington. Um, and both of those hospitals were expecting a surge in cases that ended up being not as bad as they had feared, which means there are many activities around the return to normalcy in terms of the rest of the procedures and the rest of their patient acceptance. Now, no one is saying they're out of the woods yet. And there is this sort of question about, are we going to be facing other waves and, and up and down? So there's a fair amount of caution on this. But I suspect that about consistent with the time of reopening, we're going to start seeing uh, the, 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 the hospital community begin to return to normalcy, with a few exceptions. I think infection control testing patients and isolating patients before you do other things with them, and perhaps sequestering the infected disease portions of the hospital from other portions. Those might be enduring changes that you'll see in clinics throughout the world. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at other questions. Uh, I think we are more or less done. The, there was a more general question, but I'm not sure I totally understood. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Regarding your, your point about the rise of diseases of the last uh, uh, one, one or two decades, SARS, uh, uh, Ebola, COVID-19, etc. Is this not uh, just a recent bias? Don't we just have better measurement to actually pin what's going on in our bodies? For example, in the 18th century, this would have all be classified as, uh, quote, natural causes. Or would you disagree with this take? Yeah, well, there's no question that we've gotten better at diagnosing things, but the studies I was actually uh, referring to uh, take that into account. So we are seeing an increased frequency, frequency of pandemic potential viruses, especially on the genetic side, which means uh, viruses that may be hosted in animals that then jump to humans. Um, there are many theories about why is the case. Some of it may be that we 
especially with a growing population, are closer to animals. And I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating we, are not we shouldn't be close to our pets. But if you look at industrial um, practices around meat production and other things of that nature, uh, perhaps we need to rethink some of those practices. Um, the, the, um, there's a famous epidemiologist that once said that if we really want to prevent um, pandemic flu, uh, or if we really want to prevent the flu uh, to become a pandemic, uh, we need to vaccinate as much as possible the people that are working in chicken farms and other factors, because those are often the mechanisms of jump. Uh, on some of those uh, genetic diseases. The other thing is there is an increasing body of knowledge around the role of climate and climate change and the virulence of some of these um, uh, pathogens. So, um, you know, if you think about the, the biosphere as being a giant petri dish, as you change the parameters, uh, there is evidence that, um, that some of these are forcing genetic mutations and pathogens uh, out of things like rising sea temperature and other factors. So it, it is undiscovered science. No one has a magic answer, but th there are definitely studies that show the frequency is increasing. So this might not be the 100 year pandemic that people have referred it to. This may be more like the 10 year pandemic or the 20 year pandemic, which is, uh, which is again the, the um, call to action to, to create a healthcare system that can endure and can uh, uh, respond much better than we did to this time. Okay, I think that uh, we have discussed so many, <laughs> so many things, so many issues, uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, almost one hour and a half, uh, and I don't see any other new questions. That well, I had promised you an optimistic message. I'm yeah, not sure please. if we accomplished let's, let's, that. Let's finish uh, with the lights note, please. Right. So look, you know, it's the reality is sometimes it takes a crisis to, to drive the changes that ultimately improve life. And, um, you know, whether it is an evolution of how we work, um, uh, and the role of telecommuting and learning how to work remotely, et cetera, for at least some categories of workers, whether it's building better preparation and resiliency in the healthcare system, whether it's to learn how to live with something that we don't have yet a cure or a vaccine for, but we can manage. And I think that's the, the biggest message I wanted to give people on the second half of the curve. You know, realistically, this thing is with us and it's going to be a factor in, in what we do. Um, but if that projection I showed you that has this sort of up and down oscillation, you can think of it, the fact that there is some good news in that because with the right measures, again, testing, contact tracing and so on, we can limit the impact on society and we can learn to live with this. If you ever traveled into um, uh, remote parts of the world or, or some of the low and middle income countries, um, you probably know that there are dozens of diseases that they have learned to live with. Um, it's terrible. Some people do get sick. Uh, we're all working to try to resolve those diseases. But society didn't come to a stop because of it. And they learn how to manage it. Uh, hopefully, we can learn how to manage it better than certain countries have done in low and middle income countries. But the point is, I'm optimistic that the combination of testing, contact tracing, societal measures that are reasonable, better hygiene, we're all learning how to wash hands much better, that all of those things are gonna put this thing into a manageable scenario. And then hopefully the long-term solutions that include the preparation for future pandemic uh, will be real. And it's not that long-term. So, uh, so that's my positive message is, we're learning how to manage it, learn how to manage it, uh, try not to, you know, I can't turn on the news without being bombarded with exponential curves that make it look like the end of the world is coming. The reality is I, I hope to show you some of the trends and the, and the data that suggests that we are well on our way to managing these things. And the kind of good news you got in New York uh, uh, today or yesterday from your governor is an example of, I think, more things to say. That said, 
I don't want to minimize the tragedy of the people that lost their lives and the families that were affected or the people that lost their jobs. That is clearly the penalty that we've just paid for our lack of preparation. And we'll have to figure out how, how we recover from that. Okay. Thank you, Maurizio, for your message of uh, uh, optimism, for your uh, positive note. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation. And uh, uh, I think that we are going to organize other events like this uh, um, with Los Angeles and uh, many other institutes. Thank you so much and uh, have a thank great Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you, Maria. Cheers. Bye.